spiritual warfare is millenniums old. The fight of good and evil has been there since the beginning. It's literally God versus the devil fought through the people. So, we'll try to get past one paragraph. So, what I didn't finish is these psychological techniques they try to instill a new language in you. Not a new foreign language. But they try to retrain the way you speak. And if you change the way you speak, mostly you'll change the way you live. That's what happens. And they try to instill a new belief system. And the idea of it is to try to create this new desired behaviors. All that comes by changing the way you think and trying to force you to think an entirely new way. Then you'll speak like the world, you'll live like the world, and you'll act like the world. It's exactly the same thing as this. Just in the opposite. God gives you his words. He gives you his life. He gives you his will. To change the way you speak. To change the way you live. And to change the way you act. It's the same desired outcome. Just one is good and one is evil. Do you see? So every one of us is a slave to something. Whether it's a slave unto righteousness and doing good and being right or a slave to fear, doubt, rejection, sin, evil, You're a slave to something. Because you all are so obeying something. When you obey fear, you're a slave to it. When you obey God, you're a slave to Him sort of thing. Paul called himself a prisoner unto the Lord. Now God didn't hold him in shackles. He just meant, I'm going to do what you tell me to do. But I know some of you have been a prisoner to all those other things. Some people who have lost loved ones. You know, husband, wife, child, something like that. You have every right to mourn. Without question. You have a right to, to have feelings. You have a right to have emotions. The problem is if you become a slave to that mourning. We've known people that have mourned for years at the loss of somebody they loved. And It can be very unhealthy and affect your whole life. So you ha you'd have to, if you have a piece of paper and you're writing this stuff down, write down, or even if you have a phone, put it in your phone. What am I a slave to? Or to who? 
am I a slave to? And be honest with yourself. I'm not saying you have to give me that list. You don't have to post it on social media. You can, you can take it. And you can hide it if you want to so nobody knows. But God knows. You know. The devil knows. And those closest to you know. See, often, think, often we think we're hiding things. Generally we're not. Because most of us live inside out. So what's on the inside of you, you're living on the outside. So if there's fear, rejection, all that stuff, it's very visible on the outside. Because it's how you act. So generally you're not hiding anything. Sometimes you can if you're good at it. But not very often. So just write those things down. What am I a slave to? Or who am I a slave to? And write write the answers down. And then see where that lines up with the Word of God. And systematically destroy those things in your life. It's not easy. But it is necessary. If you want to be free. If you want to be free and you don't do those things, quit desiring to be free. Quit, quit praying to God to set you free if you're not willing to take the actions that you need to take to set you free. Because all you're doing is giving God empty words. That's it. Oh God, change me, help me, set me free. But I don't want to do anything about it. Then stop asking God. Do you see? Okay. Yeah. It's awful quiet in here, isn't it? Okay. You know I'm right. Why? Because I've been there. Oh, change this in me, God. Change this in me, God. Change this in me, God. This is what you need to do to change. Okay, then I don't really want to change. I just want God to go and boom! It's all changed. I got news for you. It doesn't work that way. And every one of us has something in our lives that we need to change. At least one. But the problem, we, we've just learned to live with it. Well, this is just the way God made me. No, he didn't. It's the way you made you. And the way your circumstances made you. Because it made you think a certain way. And live that way. It's just that way. How do we know that? If somebody's had a traumatic experience in their life, it can alter the way they live. I hate to say it this way, but I'm just honest and I just say what I need to say. If a woman is attacked by a man, let's say, it can change everything about their lives. They don't go out anymore. They, they get rid of their friends. They sit in, in seclusion. In, in fear. Because that trauma has crushed them. That's what happens. And, and I know it happened physically that you were attacked physically. But there's more of a psychological attack to it than there is a physical attack most of the time. The physical pain 
fyzická bolest can go away fairly quickly. Môže odísť veľmi rýchlo. But the, the psychological pain may remain forever. Môže zostať navždy. Can now do you, do you see how the enemy uses that? This is what happens even with you as a little child, like I said. That stuff can last for the rest of your life. You can be 90 years old and still living with the effects of when you were five. It's psychological. And the enemy has used those situations for decades to control your life. And it's so subtle you don't even know what's happening. Because this is just the way God made me. No, it's not. It's your circumstances. But the good news about circumstances is they can be changed in a heartbeat. Do you see the difference? You, you can just think different. Don't succumb to the enemy's ways any longer in your life. I know that some of you went through some pretty terrible things. But you have to step out of it. Because it will affect even the next generation. And this is how things perpetuate. Generation after generation after generation. Because it creates a mindset. Psychologically. In the next generation. And then your kids. Can. I'm not going to say always do, but live in the same thing, and then they repeat it, and then it happens to the next generation, and this is what people would call a generational curse. It is not a generational curse. It's a generational choice. It's a generational mindset. Generational curses do not exist. Period. It's a generational choice. It's a generational mindset to continue living how my, my family lived. Or a, genera- a generational choice for me to treat my children how my dad treated me. You see, and we can't call that a curse. But you can call it a choice. Because everything's a choice. Every action you've ever made in your entire life was a choice. Every word you've ever said in your entire life is a choice. Every word. Even if you're not conscious of the words you're saying, your mind works so quickly that every word that I'm speaking my mind has processed it already. And that's what happens. And yet people call it a generational curse and they blame God for it. False. You know what I've learned in my life since coming out of religion I cannot blame God for anything. Nothing. Because everything that I ever did was a choice. The only thing I can blame God for is that He is good. That's it. And a story. Anything that happens that's not good is not of God. Now, let me take this psychological warfare and put it into a church setting. I'm not saying this church. I'm just saying churches. We, sp- we spend our lives in church. People say to me, oh, you don't like church very much. And why do I spend 90% of my life there? 
I love church. I love the idea of the corporate body. I just don't like, I just don't like the falsehoods of it. The falsehoods. The lies of it. So let's see how the enemy would use church to affect you psycho- psychologically. Your illness is God's will. Is God's will. You better thank Him for it. The reason you're broke is, is because God wants you broke. So the, the enemy uses preachers every weekend to affect you psychologically because they're lying to you. Do you see? If somebody tells you it's God's will that you're sick, they're lying to you. If somebody tells you that it's God's will that you you are living in poverty, they're lying to you. Now, whether they're doing it purposefully or they're just perpetuating those words because that's what they've been taught, that's up to them. But every weekend, people come into church they do not learn what's in the Bible the enemy is using the supposed word of God against you to make you believe that God is against you not true so that, that psychological warfare doesn't just happen out there it happens in churches all the time because he's using preachers to deceive people do you see how that works one of the biggest areas that this happens is in the areas of finance if you don't give God's going to curse you and then people are like, I don't want to be cursed. Especially by God. So I'm going to empty my wallet. So I don't get cursed. It's manipulation. It's manipulation. And it's fear. Do you see? That's control. Does God want you to give? Of course he does. But under threat of him killing you or beating you? That's not true. And the Bible tells you to not give under wrong motivation. If you think God is going to wipe you off the face of the earth and you give because of that, that's wrong motivation. Most people treat God like he's the mafia. If you don't give, I'm coming for you. Come on. If that's God, I'm finished. I'll quit. I've, you know, because I used to think that's what God was like. And I learned he's totally different. The number one thing God wants is obedience. And faith is obedience. If I if, if Veronica gives me ten dollars, that was her choice. <coughs> and I receive her gift. If I grab her by the throat and I steal it from her under threat was she obedient? Or did I steal it? Do you see what I'm saying? Come on. God wants obedience. Give. Bless. Sow into your local church. Absolutely. But not under fear of death, basically. It's, it's a terrible way to live. 
And the enemy uses spiritual psychological warfare all the time in, in, in churches in many different areas. So, anyway. Okay. Um, so, generally, these psychological operations are used by military and on foreign nations. Like we're seeing right now in several countries. Intelligence operators instruct those in power how to apply these techniques to subvert to control or, or change the population. We just came out of uh, Auschwitz. I don't know how to say it exactly, but... Who's, who's been there before? Yeah, not that many. It's so close. Amazing. It is so somber. Um, I don't know how to describe somber. Uh, dark is one, but just surreal, almost surreal. Going in there. And there's places that I didn't know I could actually make it to the end of it. Not out of fear. But out of the out of the, the darkness, the evil that, that still sits over that place. And I'm not afraid of any of that stuff. It's just I could feel the, the weightiness and the presence of that evil. A lot of those people that went there were told they were going to a better life. They were told all these different things. If somebody tried to run away, they were their family members were made to stand in the in the middle of the street with no clothes on. As a sign for anybody else that tried to run away. What is that? Psychological. When people are abused. As children, what do they often hear? Don't tell your mom or your dad. Otherwise, something bad's going to happen to them. Right? People that are bad will tell you, don't say anything because I'll kill your family. So you won't speak out because you want to protect your family. But it was a psychological technique by the enemy. Do you see how it works? That's how it works. How do you think blackmail works? She does something wrong. We catch her doing something wrong. She hasn't. I'm just using her for an example. Because <laughs> she's the closest to me right now. Okay. And then we have her on videotape doing something wrong, let's say. And then I get to do something wrong. And if she's going to tell somebody about my wrong, I can say, yeah, 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 but, but we have this. So if you tell anybody about me, I'm going to show them about you. Psychological against her. Because she doesn't want to get in, in trouble for what she did. So she can now be used to do other wrong things in fear of being exposed. Happens all the time. We've sat with cartel members in Mexico that these young kids 
have been told, if you don't do this, we're going to kill your parents. So they do whatever they need to do to save their parents. Now the kids have done wrong and they say, if you, if you say anything about us, we're going to expose you. So now they live in fear of being exposed and getting in trouble. And they live in fear of losing their family. So they just obey. Psychological. I hope you're seeing how all this works. And how it's, it's affected. Maybe you haven't had to deal with that situation. But how uh, even say a mom and a dad who has a child who's a drug addict, let's say. And they want to get more money. Or they need a place to live. So you begin to enable them to stay in that lifestyle because they're appealing to you psychologically, emotionally. Because they're saying, well, you, I just need a little bit more. This is, this is, this is the last time. You want me to live on the streets? You don't love me? You don't care about me? You hate me? You want me to die? It's a lot of it psychological. So you keep them in that cycle because you don't want them to do those things. But that addiction is a devil and they're using you to keep their addiction going because they're getting you psychologically and emotionally. It's how it works. It's how the devil works. And we don't even get to see, we don't even really see it because nobody really teaches this stuff. People will teach certain as, uh, um, aspects of it but they generally don't spend three full days teaching it. Now, um, the two primary fears, which we went over in the last session, used with the techniques to control or change, amplify effectiveness causing something called trauma-based mind control. It's exactly what I just talked about with the abuse and all that stuff. Now, I, I'm, I'm sorry I have to keep going back to this. It's just what the Lord's putting on my heart. And I got to say it. No matter how hard it is. Because it may be for you. And if it's not for you, have some consideration for somebody in here that it may be for them. If you were abused as a child, you would have been, most likely, you would have been told it's your fault. It's your fault that I'm doing this. If you were abused as if, if a husband's abusing a wife, they often hear if you didn't do this, I wouldn't have to hit you. I wouldn't have to treat you this way if you were just the, the right wife. If you didn't act this way, I wouldn't have to do it. This is your fault. This is happening to you. It's this. It's these trauma-based mind control. It's not, it's not of God. It's of the devil. I hope you can see that. I've seen a lot of abuse in my life. Not necessarily done to me, but in others and wives and husbands and children. And it, it, by the way, it works both ways. Wives can do that to men too. 
It's just usually this way. Okay. And mind control doesn't ha- trauma-based mind control doesn't have to be that severe. It can be in a marriage very subtle. If you grew up hearing certain words from your dad, let's say, and your wife, let's say, knows about it, and you guys get into an argument or fight or something, some of those words will come out to remind you it's psychological. Because it can bring you right back to that thing. This is why you have to kill the power of that those words had over you. So even if you hear them, it's like, yeah, I hear that. But that's not me. That's the way it's supposed to work. Because then the enemy loses his power against you. Do you see? So I, I didn't mean this first two sessions to be, you know, really deep. But it needed to be. Because some of your wounds are decades deep. And God is trying to use me to free you. Because he's been knocking on your door for a long time. But the pain has kept him away. Stop running. It's, it's tiring. It's exhausting. See, God's got more endurance than anybody. Stop running from Him. You can't do it. Sure, there's a point where God will just be like, okay, you go wherever you want to go. I'm right here. But He's always got His eye on you. But you keep running, you're going to get awful tired. Okay, now, these things, so all these things we've talked about, are done to this, uh, are designed to make someone, such as an enemy or an opponent, be less confident, get this, or to feel hopeless, afraid, or anything like that. With modern advances in communications, such as social media, together with important developments, in the fields of public opinion analysis, and the prediction of mass behavior. Psychological warfare has become a more systematic and widespread technique in strategy and tactics and a larger ingredient in warfare as a whole. Do you see that? The prediction of mass behavior. Because they just put, like I said from the beginning, they put it out on the news, they put it on the phone, social media, whatever. Everybody starts talking about it. So then everybody starts doing it. And they've controlled the population with a social media platform. They have created robots. Do you see that? And people just don't even think for themselves. You're not allowed to think for yourself anymore. If you question anything they're doing, you're anti science. Oh, give me a break. It's. it's But that's what they that's what they try to instill in you. 
Ale to je vlastne sa snažia rozdeliť. It's all psychological. Je to všetko psychologické. Okay, so I, I hope you can see this. Now, how does psyops or psychological operations work? Remember, this is just the introduction page. So, there's, there's a lot of information here. Psyops or psychological operations are used at all levels. Strategic, operational, tactical, and spiritual. So these these psychological operations are used in Christians and non-Christians because they're all the devil's tactics. Okay? They're designed to influence policy. Decisions, commands. And, and the will of the target audience which is society. So certain things that would work here maybe won't work exactly the same in Canada. So they just tweak it a little bit. And then it works there. But the basis of it is the same. The mind of Christians is the main target of the enemy and governing bodies. Get the mind and you will have the submission and the will of people. In other words, if Satan can get your mind, he will have your will. Again, a wife that's been abused the idea of that is to break down the other person's will. So you just conform continually. It's just the way it's designed to work. And it's very effective. The person's will will be conformed to whatever the masses are doing and whatever is being propagated by the media. The devil is a master at profiling people by the decisions they've made in the past. So Satan can't really predict your future. But he can sort of predict your future by your past actions. If he comes at you with this tactic and you obeyed it the last 10 times he's brought it, he's assuming that you're going to do it again. And he gets surprised when you don't do that. Because he j- he'll just use the same thing against you all the time. <laughs> Why change it if it's working? You see? You want to mess the devil up? Next time he comes and tries to get you to do this thing, don't do it. Because then they'll be like, and by the way, it's not, it's not Satan that's coming towards you. It's his little minions, his little devils. See, Satan is not omnipresent. He's not on the body. Satan can't be everywhere at one time. His spirit can't be anywhere at one time. Satan has a physical body made up of, of spiritual matter. So does God. God is on the present. Meaning his spirit is everywhere. The devil is not. You get his little minions that are after you. So when people say, oh, Satan's really after me today. No, he's not. He's going after the world leaders. He, he's, he's, the, the devil wants to fry the biggest fish. And in the grand scheme of things, 
We're not really big fish in, in, in the world. We're a bigger fish than he is, for sure. But he's going after world leaders to create war and all these other things we've been talking about. So generally, you're afraid of a little tiny devil wimp. Don't fear it. They're afraid. The spirit of fear, which we'll look at, is not a big, like, I'm a little bit bigger than her. Okay? So, this is how people think that the spirit of fear, oh, sorry, fear, spirit of fear looks. Like, I'm the big spirit of fear. Okay? It's not. The spirit of fear is an afraid spirit. That's why he's the spirit of fear. He's afraid. Do you see? Whoever had a bully growing up in school? What happened when you didn't stand up to them? They bullied you every day, right? What happened when you did stand up to them? They ran. Now, I'm not saying you should do this. I'm not saying this at all. I'm just giving you my story. In grade four, I moved to a new school. And the, the tough kid of the school, who beat everybody else up, to be the tough guy of the school, challenged me to a fight. He, he lost miserably. This was in grade four. He became my best friend. Because he figured if I don't become this guy's friend, he's going to beat me up every day. So we were best friends for like 30 years. Now, I'm not telling you to do that. Don't put, um, don't, do not go beat up your friends. But I stood up to a bully. And I wasn't bullied any longer. Now, I'm using that as an example. So you stop getting bullied by the devil. Because this, this big, scary thing you're afraid of. It's just... Do they have power? Sure. But they have more psychological ability than they do power. Most Christians fear the devil, yet they have no fear of God. Do you see how backwards that is? Well, we're not supposed to fear God. Yes, you are. The Bible says many times to fear God. Not as an abusive father. I'm not saying that. It tells you to fear God and it tells you not to fear the devil. Most, most Christians do the opposite. It's amazing. I used to be afraid of casting out devils. Because I didn't want the devil to jump on me. Or whatever. And now for years, we cast out devils every country we go to. And we've seen devils try to do all sorts of things. Attacking people's bodies. Throwing up. Throwing up blood speaking in unknown languages flashing all sorts of devil signs and, and I just stand there and laugh at him not the person what's in him because I used to fear that I don't fear him at all there is no fear of the enemy in me at all 
because I know my position in Christ. We're just going to finish this paragraph and we'll let you go. Um, your past, if not changed, is a perfect indicator of your future. What did I say earlier on? The reason they're trying to change the past is they can repeat it in the future. That's why in the United States, even in Canada, not sure about here, but they're tearing down statues of old war heroes, past presidents, whether they were good or bad, they were still part of history. And they're trying to erase it. So you can repeat it. Now, people say that you need to forget your past. I say that's partially true. Not entirely true. What I say is don't forget your past. Just choose not to remember it. Do you see the difference? If I choose to remember all the things that happened to me, then I'll live by it. If I don't forget it, I'll know never to visit it again. Do you see the difference? You can't always forget everything that's happened to you. You have to lose your memory. And that's not good either. But you can choose not to remember it. I can choose to remember stories about my life that would have most of you crying in here. It has no effect on me. None. I could talk about it because it has no effect on me. But I choose not to remember it. Unless I wanted to. I just don't want to. But that doesn't mean I forgot it. There's certain things we'll be talking about that in this with people teaching the truth of the God's word that have become ditches. And one of those ditches is completely forgetting what your past. No. Because sometimes that past part of your life can be just what somebody in front of you needs to hear that you went through, that they're going through. It's called sharing our testimony. Do you see? But if I choose to remember it, then it's going to control my life. If I choose to think about it, while I'm glorifying God and where he's brought me from it's not wrong to see the difference but we get taught never talk about your past never remember your past and yes there's truth to that but there's also a ditch you see so anyway 10 minute break we'll, we'll come back and then We're on to page two. Okay. We'll see you guys soon.